What's going on everybody? This is Jake Berkey from Rock Rods and Busted Knuckle Films and today we're going to talk about spring selection. We're going to teach you guys how to choose the right springs for your ride and a lot of the theory that's behind it so you make an educated decision whenever you're building your rig. Now, I want to talk about some of the other videos that we've done because they're very important. We talked about how to build a four-link suspension system and the geometry that surrounds that. So make sure you go into some of the other videos and check those out. We talked about rebuilding a shock. We talked about sway bars. And then we talked about the different types of shocks, whether you're running an air shock or a coilover or a bypass. And all that stuff's going to come into play whenever we get to our final video. So make sure that you take a look at that stuff and review them. So today for spring selection, I want to talk about the main goal in selecting the springs, and that's called selecting your spring frequency. Now, without your right frequency, you're not going to be able to get your suspension to do the right thing. It's going to be either too stiff or too soft, and you're never going to be able to dial it in. So how do you choose the natural frequency of a, of a spring for your rig? Well, we've got formulas and things, but I want to talk to you a little bit first about in your head visualizing the way this whole thing works. So take two springs in your mind, a heavy spring and bolt it to a table and a soft spring and bolt it to the same table. Now take the heavy spring, pull it back and let it go. It's going to go very abruptly and stop. The softer spring, if you do the exact same thing, pull it back and let it go, it's going to move back and forth a couple times and then slowly stop, right? So that's the frequency of a spring. Now, we know from experience what we're trying to target, so we know what your end goal is. So for those of you who like to do math problems, your frequency is over here, and then that is the square root of your spring stiffness over the mass. So you can use that calculation to kind of understand how this is all working. But what I want you to understand from our demonstration with the two springs bolted to the table is this. If you have a soft spring, you pull it back and let it go, and it does this big, long movement, right? Then you take your heavy spring, and you pull it back, and it does a soft, uh, a quick movement. What happens when you take a heavy weight and put it on top of the heavy spring and do the exact same thing? You pull it back and let it go. Guess what? If you have the right weight, you can make that heavy spring move just like that soft spring. So that's what we're trying to do when we do suspension frequency tuning and calculations. You're trying to target the frequency. You know what your frequency needs to be, and therefore you're going to take this equation and turn it into what you need to do, and that is the springs that you need to buy. So the way that you make the thing work is if you know what your frequency is supposed to be, and you know what your mass is, you can solve the equation for the spring stiffness. Now, there's calculators out there all over the place. You can call me up and I can do the calculation for you. I've got my own spreadsheets and things. Or you can go and search around the internet. But keep in mind that they are trying to give you a suspension frequency generally around 60 miles an hour. But you've got to be honest with yourself. If you're a guy on the East Coast and you're a rock bouncer, you're probably not doing 60 miles an hour. More than likely, you're doing slower than that, especially if you're doing rock crawling. But if you're doing rock bouncing and you feel like you're really bombing a hill, your feelings will get hurt if you ever got a radar detector and you shot yourself. You're probably doing 15, 20, 30, 40 miles an hour at max. Then you got the guys out there in the desert. They don't have any trees to dodge. They're going across at 100, 150 miles an hour. All they got to worry about shrubs and things. Now, they're going to have a, a suspension frequency that's a lot higher than the guys over here on the East Coast. So what you're doing with a vehicle makes a big difference in what you're trying to accomplish with your frequency. So now let's talk about speed and control because all that stuff comes into play. A softer spring is going to give you less control at a higher speed, right? It's just, it's just common knowledge. Picture yourself a Corvette and a um, Cadillac sitting side by side. They go down the line, and then they both go to turn. The Cadillac goes way over on its side because it has softer springs on it. But guess what? It feels nice and, and plush whenever you're hitting some bumps. The Corvette's going to feel nice and tight whenever you're hitting bumps, but it's going to take that corner a lot better. 
So therefore, as you increase speed and performance, you generally want to increase your spring frequency by the stiffness of the spring. But you got to be honest with yourself, how fast are you really going? So keep that in mind. So we've talked a little about the natural spring frequency, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. When you talk about the mass, your mass of your vehicle is what's on top of the spring. And the spring is going to change depending on how much mass you're putting on top of your spring. The next thing we want to talk about is primary and secondary rates because the calculation that we're talking about whenever we get this number for our spring frequency is going to be your primary rate. Now primary spring rates are what's your top spring and your bottom spring combined. If you have a dual rate system like a coilover. Now let's say you don't have a dual rate system like a coilover and you only have one spring in your system like on a Polaris Razor or something like that. The way that you can still get a dual rate system with that is by going to a spring that looks like this. Right here you've got spring coils that are tightly bound together and then underneath it you've got them to where they're spaced out farther. What happens is when you have these springs that are tighter together like this it gives you a softer spring rate than if your springs are wound wider like this. And so what happens is as the spring starts to compress this gets into what's called coil bind, meaning that all the coil springs flatten out and it becomes a solid piece of metal. Then you go into the bottom spring only, and when you go into that bottom spring only, it's going to allow your spring rate to change. So this is what's a dual rate spring on a single style system. If you have a coilover system, you have springs that are stacked on top of each other like this right here. So for our example, we're going to use two springs that are 100 pounds each. Now, if you have a 100 pound over a 100 pound, what do you think it's going to be? 100 pounds? You're wrong. It's actually 50 pounds. And what happens is, when you have the two that are on top of each other, it actually creates a softer spring rate. So you can target a primary and a secondary spring rate by stacking the springs on top of each other. This is the formula. Your top spring times your bottom spring divided by your top spring plus your bottom spring. So 100 times 100 divided by 100 plus 100 equals 50. So therefore, you can actually have a softer spring rate with two springs on top of each other, but how does that work with suspension tuning? So as these two springs are traveling up and down and you're using your spring slider with one spring on top and one spring on bottom, as your springs are moving up and down, as the suspension moves, you're in the 50 pound rate. These right here are called your secondary rate adjusters. And you adjust these down so that right before the suspension bottoms out, your spring slider hits your secondary rate adjusters and now your top spring stops moving, it's out of the equation, and you're only using the bottom spring. So guess what? You're at 100 pounds. So you can go from 50 pounds to 100 pounds and change the way your springs react. Now, another thing that you can do is you can take a 100 pound spring over a 100 pound spring and start changing the way that those things are related to each other. Go to a 75 pound spring and a 125 pound spring. You still got 50 pound spring rate, right? But when you come into your secondary rate, you're gonna come in harder. You're gonna come into the 125 pounds or 150 pounds or whatever you choose just by changing the ratios between those two. So a dual rate system is very key when it comes to suspension tuning because you can change the way that the shock reacts to the terrain that you're in. Now that we know how the theory is behind all this stuff, let's talk about how to choose the right springs for your vehicle. Now that we've talked about the theory and everything behind spring oscillation and all that stuff and, and basically the frequency of your springs and choosing the right springs, if you remember in the formula, there's the square root and the bottom denominator is mass, right? You gotta know what the vehicle's weight is in order to do these calculations. There's two mainstream ways that we do that. One is just by using scales and the other one's by using the spring method. Now if you use scales, it's pretty self-explanatory. You just weigh the vehicle, right? But don't do this. Don't take your vehicle, put it on scale, say it weighs 5,000 pounds, then estimate your wheels and tires by doing Google searches and then estimate how much front and rear bias you have just by throwing an arbitrary number out there. If you do that, then you're not going to have an accurate reading. If you're going to go through this, go through and do it right and make sure you get accurate numbers by using the scales on each corner and getting your unsprung and your sprung weights 
figured out the way that they need to be, okay? Now, the second way that you can do that is by using the spring method. Now, I really like this method because it's very accurate and it works very well. All you have to have is a suspension that's built, a coil over, spring slider, and some springs. It's pretty simple. You take your coil over, you bolt it in just like you would whenever your suspension is built. Take your secondary array adjusters and slide them all the way down until they bottom out. Take a spring slider, stick it at the very bottom of that. Then take your spring and slide your spring up. Now, if you know what your distance is with this spring at full extension, and then you know the weight that this spring is, 100 pound, 150 pound, whatever it is, when you put the vehicle's weight all the way around in a circle, you put it all the way down, you can calculate how much weight you have on that spring by how much it compresses. It's actually a very accurate way of doing it, but one thing that I need to caution you on is the only way it works just straight up is if you have a spring and a shock that's mounted perfectly vertical. Because if you mount your shock at an angle at all, that is going to change how much weight is actually being applied to these shocks. That's called your leverage factor, and we're gonna talk about that here in just a second. So, another thing I need to caution you on is making sure that the vehicle's level when you do the spring method. If your vehicle is sitting at an angle like this, you're not going to get an accurate reading. In this, say, in this situation, you might be only trying to figure out what one axle weighs or one, one front or one rear um, is weighing. So you might be just doing one of those. Um, in this scenario right here, basically, this is like um, you're carrying a couch up some stairs and your asshole friend's at the top of the stairs and you're at the bottom and he's looking at you like, you know, why are you struggling? But you're carrying this big couch up these stairs, you know what I mean? And you're pissed off at him. Well, don't be pissed off, you know what I mean? This is just this is just simple stuff right here. Make sure that your truck is sitting level. If it's sitting level, then you and your buddy are sharing the load perfectly evenly, and then you guys can both be mad at each other because you have to carry a couch for your mom and move it all over the house. So in this situation right here, your springs are gonna have equal amounts of pressure on them, basically. So don't make your calculations with your vehicle going downhill because some of the weight is going to be into the tire and your springs are going to see less and your calculation is not going to be proper. So that's number one. Number two is making sure that your motion ratio and everything is where it's supposed to be. So for instance, a shock that's not mounted perfectly plumb is going to see more force into the springs than that of a shock that is mounted plumb and the reason is what's called motion ratio. So this right here is a link bar. This right here is an axle tube. This is an axle tube, this is differential. So this is looking at the side of the vehicle and this is looking at the back of the vehicle. And what I'm, what I'm trying to show you here is that as you move the shock from plumb going forward or going inward to the vehicle, anywhere from plumb, you're going to get a different ratio between the axle and the actual shock. So for instance, let's do something crazy and extreme and take this shock and move it all the way down like this. If the axle was moving straight up and down right here, you would actually get only a little bit of shock movement, right? So you could take this 16 inch shock right here, move it straight up and down, you're going to get 16 inches of travel. You start taking that shock and start moving it in, now you've got 18 inches and 20 inches and 24. But as you start trading that off, as you start trading off that work for distance, you end up getting spring rates that are going to be different. For instance, work is force times distance. So if you take that shock and you lay it down, now the shock is going a smaller distance and the axle is going a larger distance. So therefore, the force that you have to apply is going to have to be greater to create the same amount of work. And that work is what is your spring rate, okay? So whenever you start to look at this stuff, you have to be very careful that your, that your shock is, is directly on plumb and then you get your reading. Or if it's off of plumb by any amount, you take that angle, multiply it times the cosine, and that gives you your correction factor. And that correction factor times those springs is going to give you what your vehicle's weight is, okay? So in this particular scenario, you're just going with this particular cosine times alpha to get your correction factor. Trailing arms is where it becomes very difficult. 
because you have two things to pay attention to. You have a lever arm here, where this is basically a second class lever, where this is your pivot point, this is your axle, and here is your shock. And in this scenario right here, picture this being a crowbar. You've got a crowbar down on the ground, and you go to pick something up. This is where you're pulling your arm up, this is where whatever it is that you're trying to pick up is, and this is um, your crowbar on the ground. Well, this is the pivot point of the chassis, this is your spring, and this is your arm or the axle. So in this scenario, you, by the crowbar method, you know that you're going to have to have a heavier spring to create the same amount of force out here at your tire, right? So in that situation, you're going to have to have a larger spring. And when you have a larger spring like that, you have to take another thing into consideration, and that is how much your shock is off of plumb. So if your shock is off of plumb this way, a certain degree, you have your correction factor for the shock being forward, then you also have your correction factor for the shock being mounted up the trailing arm. So it's a little bit more difficult to create those things. Now, I don't want to confuse you too much. I'm not going to go into the math because I'll lose all my viewers if I do that. You can go online and you can, you can go to a bunch of different places and all this stuff is sitting right there where you can just type in vehicle rate, you can type in how much your shock is off of plumb and all that stuff and it'll spit out what your primary rate is. Now remember your primary rate is your upper and your lower combined rate is going to give you a primary rate. So it's very easy to do that. You can also call me up and I've got a spreadsheet that I've actually done some of the trigonometry and stuff like that and I can actually tell you right off the bat exactly what your spring rates should be to be able to get you the, the uh, oscillation, the spring oscillation that we were talking about earlier uh, directly on the dot. So just give me a shout if you need any of that stuff and I'll give you some help but I want you to understand why we start looking at some of the angles and everything like that. Two more things I want to talk about. Spring size, very simple. A two inch shock gets a two and a half inch spring. A two and a half inch shock gets a three inch spring. The shock is going to be smaller than the spring. It sounds pretty self explanatory, but almost every time I get a customer with a two and a half inch shock, they try to order a two and a half inch spring. Well, it needs to be a three inch spring so that you have movement around the spring uh, or with the shock in the middle of the spring, right? So pay attention to that. Make sure whenever you go to do your orders, if you're not understanding just give me a shout and I'll help you out as best I can and we'll get you going in the right direction. Last thing we're going to talk about is preload. You've heard it before and we're going to talk about why we put preload on shocks. So for a shock to absorb the most amount of terrain you need that shock to go through its entire travel. The problem is with a spring is that the last 10% of a spring pushing out it loses its ability to push out its force. Okay so for a 16 inch spring, the last 1.6 inches, it basically exponentially drops off with its ability to be able to push out. So if you have a shock that needs to return all the way down to the very bottom to get ready for the next bump in order to give you the most suspension travel possible, and you have a spring that's getting to the point where it's at the very bottom of its stroke, it's not going to push out all the way to the very bottom. So what we do is we put preload on the springs to get rid of that. So we take our, our adjusters on the top of your coilover, these two nuts right here, and you compress the spring while the, while the shock is at its very rested point. So you drop the suspension all the way out until it's just hanging. And then you compress the springs by using these two nuts until you get the preload on the shock. Okay. It's not when the shock, it, it's not when the vehicle's sitting at a dead stop, it's when it's extended all the way. Once you get your preload on your springs, then you let the vehicle down and the springs will compress. And if you're not at your right ride height, then you probably need to change springs. Now, that right there was one of those, you know, one of those industry type terms, right? There's a bunch of scenarios where you're not going to have the right preload. If you have a lot of droop in your axle, you're not going to be able to get the right preload. If you have an 18-inch shock or a 16-inch shock and almost all of that's down travel and very little up, you're going to pop the springs out unless you have springs that are so soft that it's going to almost flip over whenever you hit a corner at any speed. So 
as a general rule, we like to see 10% of the shot uh, of the coil springs distance in preload. But if you can't achieve that, don't just give up because you can still tune the suspension to do what you need it to do pretty accurately without having all the preload. But keep in mind, preload is something that's very important. So um, definitely take a look into that stuff. Now, I want you guys to take a look at some of our other videos again and make sure that you understand all the different stuff in our other videos because all this stuff is going to wrap up here in a little while and we're going to talk about suspension tuning. If you don't understand all the basics when you get into suspension tuning, you're not going to understand the reasons why I'm saying some of the things I'm saying. So definitely check out those other videos. Two more things I need to ask you to do. Make sure you like and subscribe on YouTube to Busted Knuckle Films and like them on Facebook, okay? Because we're doing all this stuff and this helps us get all this ball rolling and I can get all this information back out to you guys. So if you're not liking the videos and all that stuff, then our sponsors and things, you know, they, they don't want to give us as much money and time and everything else that we have to be able to help you guys out. Uh, the third thing, make sure you go to um, Facebook and you check out my Facebook page. Uh, which is Jake Berkey Riot Buggy. I do a lot of impromptu videos and things where I teach you guys little things here and there on my cell phone when I don't want to get out the camera and everything like that. So you guys make sure you go and check out that stuff. The more I get on there, the better it is for me and the more information I can get out to you. I'm full of stuff to help you guys out with. So definitely check that stuff out. And I'll tell you what, you get your suspension tuned and do some of the stuff that I say, Make sure that you come up to me and say thank you because I'm telling you, if you do what I'm telling you right now, your vehicle is going to make so many improvements and you're going to be able to drive so much better off-road and it's going to climb a lot better and do what you want it to do. So hope to see you guys out on the trail and I really hope you like the video.